Okay, um, moving straight on from um, Graham, and we're now going to look at very much a subset of those collections that uh, Graham's been talking about. And the ones that we're talking about now are going to be the new species. Um, what happens when we find new species? We first of all produce a description and we also produce a type specimen. So it's the type specimens that are in our collection that I'm going to be talking about now. And uh, what is a type specimen? Well, when we describe a new species, that dried press specimen of a representative plant is designated as, as a type and um, that's a permanent reference point for any name of, of a new species and anybody can have, a, have a, can check that name against the type specimen. And in the state of Arium of South Australia, I really don't know how many we've got, but uh, there's a lot. And uh, they're kept separately in, a, in the type bay and they are kept in red folders. And the rules of international uh, nomenclature by which plants are named, these were only first proposed by the French in 1867. And the, in those rules, there was no concept of a type specimen, which I, which I found actually quite surprising. You always, when you're working, working in this um, area, you just assume that, that everybody's worked under the, same, um, under the same rules. So the concept of the type specimen is actually a, quite a modern concept, and it first appeared in the uh, 1934 International Rules of Botanical Nomenclature. Um, and was passed um, in, at the meeting in Cambridge in 1930. Um, so we've got a lot of catching up to do because the first names, plant names, actually date back from 18, uh, sorry, 1753. So that we've got all those Linnaean names with, so here's a carrot for instance, there's the type of, of the carrot. And that was, the type specimen was only proposed in 1929 and confirmed in 1992. So here's a tribulus caltrop um, specimen, the same, and uh, the sunflower, the same thing. So they are the Linnaean type specimens and, and again, only recognised relatively recently. So um, I think somebody, there's already been passing reference to the Global Plants um, um, project when the uh, Mellon Foundation um, gave money for the digitisation of the type collections in the Australian herbaria. And um, not only the Australian herbaria but also um, other herbaria all around the world have also been digitising their plant specimens and these have been gathered together into a JSTOR global plants uh, site and you can go to that site and you can see the type specimens of um, lots and lots of different plant names. And the advantages to that for a specialist botanist is that there's instant availability. Um, you don't have to borrow, or you may not necessarily have to borrow the specimens as we've done in the past. And um, we find previously unknown specimens and um, we can make better decisions when choosing our type specimens. And, um, and the general botanist can also use those um, types for checking identifications. So before capturing the image of the specimens of the types that we have here in Adelaide, um, we needed to check through those types and just make sure that what we were putting up there were actually types um, and that they were correctly labelled and, and date-based. So our type collection falls into two groups. Um, those that were described, the new species that were described after January the 1st, 1958, they are easy, but those after January the 1st, sorry, see the typo, 1958, they ain't quite easy at all. So here's an example of um, four, four species that have been described by current botanists, um, who, well, people who've been involved in the um, Adelaide Botanic Gardens, Journal of the Adelaide Botanic Gardens, um, in describing their new species. And you can see that AD, um, We've got holotype AD, holotype AD. That means that we've got a type specimen in, in the herbarium. Um, but the person who, who actually um, made that the type species, they chose it. So the author has chosen the type species in that case. But before the 1st of January 1958, 
The decisions on what is going to be the type species was, is actually the interpretation of the author's intention by other people. So to make that decision about what should be the type species means that you actually have to have a sound knowledge of the taxonomy of the group concerned. You have to know the background of the botanist who published the new species. You have to know about the collector who made the collections, know the present day whereabouts of the collections, uh, which collections were likely to have been consulted by the botanist, and you may need to be able to recognise handwriting. That's, that's, the, that's the start. Um, so here's one of our main um, contributors to our type specimens. And um, the ones that I'll be dealing with here are all pre that 1958 date. So here decisions are being made not by the person who described the new species, but by people who are now looking at these, these things um, again at a later time. So J.M. Black, we've already talked about, um, he wrote the first flora of South Australia that wasn't really just a copy of what was, had been produced earlier in Kew. Um, and as, as a result of that, he actually published um, quite a lot of new taxa. So we've got seven genera, 182 species and 146 varieties. And of the um, 19,000 odd collections in the herbarium of J.M. Black in Adelaide, there's, there's, well, there's at, at the moment 583, but there's, there's going to be more types than that um, within the collection. Um, and just as an example of, of one, here's, here's his description of, of Veronica pancaliana, the species. And down the bottom, um, at, the, at the bottom, you can see what he wrote at the time that he published this. All he's done is cited near Port Lincoln, Collector Griffith, October 1909. And sorry, um, you can see that's exactly that's been taken exactly from there. And if we go to the collection, we can find a specimen and we can find that it's been labelled Veronica Pancaliana, J.M. Black. And we can also see that it's been collected from Port Lincoln on, um, in October 2009 and um, it's also been collected by Griffith. So therefore, this is in fact the type specimen. This, is really, this one's been a pretty easy one. But here's the ones where it isn't so easy. This is a typical J.M. Black collection as it was received at the Herbarium. This is not what they look like now, but this is what they used to look like. They came in a folder with the name on the outside. When you open that folder, there were 11 separate collections in that folder, and nine of them are types. And the type, type citation you can see down the bottom, Hope Valley, uh, collections from Hope Valley. So any collection amongst those 11, any collection from Hope Valley in Counter Bay or River Finnis or Kangaroo Island is a type. Well, that's fine. A botanist has come along and he's decided what the type is in this case. So you can see that that lector type in the second bit there, where it says lector type, Kangaroo Island, J.B. Cleland, 16th of November, 1924. Well, when we have a look, we've got these two collections here. Both of them were collected on Kangaroo Island. They were both collected by J.B. Cleland, and they were both collected on the 16th of November, 1924. So which one is the lector type? So these are the sorts of things that we keep, we keep coming across and, and having to resolve. Um, R.S. Rogers, the orchidologist, um, also is very, um, his, his types are mostly in the uh, collection as well. So um, at the moment we've, well, we've got near enough to 3,000 of his collections, but these haven't all been databased uh, because these are orchids and there are problems. Um, at the moment, I think we've, there's only 52 of his types that are in the database, but there are many, I'm sure that there are many more types of his names. Um, and his specimens, I'll just give you one example here of um, a diurus. Uh, again, we've got that citation of where he collected it from. That's all we've got to go on. And when he collected it, November to December. 
And there are at least 16 specimens in AD, most of them in the Rogers herbarium, which are candidates when we go to choose the type. But in Rogers' case, what he's done in his herbarium, his herbarium is, is they are always mounted in these um, cardboard folders, and this one's been opened up and so you can see what's actually in it. And on the outside, he's actually annotated it as the type and in, in, in blue and also in red. And we also have his card index, which he also says on this which specimen he considers to be the type. The only problem is that all of that has to have been done after he'd, after he'd actually published these names because, um, now I've lost my train of thought, um, because he never nominated types in any of his publications. So that's an interesting, um, because in fact all his, all his types, sorry, all his new species were published before 1930, so he didn't have to anyway. And I'm not quite sure what that, what that means with respect to the types of orchids. And Ralph Tate, we've also talked about again, he, he also described um, a number of new taxa, new species, um, along with um, Ferdinand von Mueller. Um, so there's about 100 new names based on his collections. Um, here we've got an example of one of his collections. And this is a Gardenia larapinta. And you can see, if you have a look at the specimen on the left-hand side of that, um, it's actually labelled as being from Glen Edith, and so it is a type. And again, in this case, somebody has chosen the type. Um, and because you can see the label at the top where it says it's a lectotype. But what that person hasn't done, they haven't actually, they've said that the whole, by putting just lectotype at the top, they've said that that whole sheet is a lectotype, but one of the specimens on that sheet just isn't, isn't even that, spe even even, sorry, isn't even that species. So, um, pretty sloppy. Was that me already? Yeah. Two minutes, okay. Um, Graham mentioned Richard Helms and our volunteers working on these. These are, these are horrible things to work with. Uh, because the labels, you just, you've got nothing to go on and trying to work out what belongs with what. You've really only got a date to go by. Um, I won't go into them. But finding specimens we didn't know we had is one of the other things that happens. So um, in this case, we had some Russian, there's some Russian people borrowed our specimens and looking for the type of Lotus Australis barbarianus. And um, that's named after Herman Baer, um, who collected in South Australia in the years 1840 to 50, and he never went further north than the Flinders Ranges, but the type was said to be taken from Mount Olga. And when, um, when we delved into the collections, we found, actually did find two specimens, one from the Murray and one from York Peninsula, and both of them are actually labelled as Lotus Berianus, and so we do have types in that case. Francis, we haven't been able to find his collections, even though um, he, Miller, Muller um, thanked him for his botanical collections are not in Melbourne, no nowhere else that we can find. Um, Schomburg ne never ever described any species, but he kept a herbarium. But it's mostly a collection of other, other people's um, collections. And his label looks like that. Um, any Schomburg herbarium has just got a name, his name, sorry, the name of the plant and his name and maybe the state that it's been collected in, which isn't terribly helpful. And um, what's happening now with this global digitisation is that we can look at specimen, a specimen in Kew. This one was collected by Port, from Port Darwin by Schultz, and it is a type. And if we go to that, and we can see that Schomburg sent it to Kew, um, and if we go to that uh, label and see the South Australian material, it is in fact very similar. And so there's fairly good chance that that might in fact be a duplicate of, of the specimen there. Um, so are they duplicates and is the AD specimen a type? And yeah, we won't do those. So um, by doing these passes through the collections, we've got uh, lots and lots more types than we ever thought that we had. Um, that we've, there's been some pretty crummy work done by botanists in the past, but you know, there, I think there's, there's excuses that can be made for that. And so working globally, we're making a much better understanding of how and where our older plant collections have ended up. And, gained that, and um, the history behind our collections is being unravelled. And where, what else might we might, might find in the collection? Well, stay tuned. 
And this has all been so much easier because of all these digitisation projects, the biodiversity library, etc., etc. Um, so 30 years ago, we wouldn't have had a hope of doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. <laughs>